beautiful people. My name is Rachel and thanks for stopping by. I'm so excited for this video because I'm going to be telling you about an unsolved mystery that has always been one of my favorites and I've done a lot of research and watched a lot of videos, read a lot of articles, and I'm just so excited to be able to share this case with you. Before we get started, I do want to say that if you like the way my makeup looks, I do have a video that I filmed for my channel that is already up and you can see how I accomplished this look. I use the Jeffree Star Morphe palette collaboration. But to go ahead and jump right into things, this video is about the unsolved, mysterious death of Gloria Ramirez. She is often referred to as the toxic lady because when she passed away, her body caused a bunch of reactions to happen in the hospital workers who were tending to her. But I'm gonna give you a lot more detail. First, I do wanna talk about Ramirez before she went into the hospital and who she was as a person because this case so often as unsolved cases or mysterious things that are often talked about, the person is kind of dwindled down to who they were at that time, not who they were overall as a person, which I think is really important to talk about, especially after someone's died because they can't represent themselves the way that they wanted to be. And I know that no one wants to die and be referred to as those types of things. So Ramirez was 31 years old and at the time of her hospital visit, she had just found out that she had cervical cancer about a month before and it was in its late stages. So she had about a year to live. She had two kids. She was a stay at home mom and she was engaged to be married. And she was really involved in her kids lives. She volunteered at their school and she just seemed like a really great mother. I couldn't find a lot of details on how she was, but she just seemed like a really simple woman who loved her kids. Whenever she did pass away, her family was kind of tormented. There were some very insensitive comments made online and her son was even bullied at school saying that his mom was a monster and just really hurtful comments that I can't believe anyone would say. When someone is going through the healing process, the mourning process of losing a parent, I just can't believe that you would ever say something like that telling this poor kid that his mom is a monster. Her half brother once was watching TV and he heard a comedian say that she must have eaten a really spicy burrito to be able to cause the effects that she did. Just things that, you know, are really insensitive and really cruel. You might be wondering, why are people saying these things? So let's go ahead and jump into the case. Gloria lived in Riverside, California, and one evening she was not feeling well. She had been throwing up and was having trouble breathing. And so she called 911 and was rushed to the local hospital in Riverside in an ambulance and in that ambulance she had an IV inserted and it came out later that apparently some of her blood had been spilled when the IV was being inserted within the ambulance but it really wasn't a big deal but you'll understand why I'm mentioning this later. It was February 19th, 1994 at 8.15 p.m. when Ramirez finally arrived at the hospital. She was having severe heart palpitations. She it was said that she was having tachycardia. And so when she arrived, they took her to her room and gave her a bunch of medications and started doing normal protocols to help this woman. I'm going to go ahead and say this. I don't know a lot about medical care. I don't study medicine. So some of my pronunciations of the words and some of my understandings of what was actually going on might not be as clear as a health professional, but I studied business, so just bear with me. Also, in a lot of the videos that I watched, they talk about this case in very technical medical terms, but I'm gonna try to cut out a lot of that because I think just for the average person watching this, those words really don't mean anything. Like people listed off the medicines that they gave her and that didn't really mean a lot to me. You might care more about that, but if you do, you can easily go watch one of those videos after you watch this one. So they injected her with a bunch of sedatives and different things to help her body. So they put her to sleep and she was responding really poorly to the medicine. Um, she was injected with a couple of IVs and the second one was, was to draw her blood into a syringe. And when that happened, the first nurse stated that it smelled kind of like ammonia. Ramirez also was said to have a garlicky, fruity smell coming from her mouth, which the first nurse noticed. Which I don't really know what garlicky, fruity smells like, but 
apparently a very specific smell. And um, the second nurse came to try to get us closer look at it and notice in the blood there were some little manila colored crystals and that was also confirmed by the head doctor on the case. So there were three nurses in the room at the time and whenever they noticed that she was responding poorly to everything that they had been doing they decided that they were going to defibrillate. So they had to obviously remove her shirt so that they could shock her heart and when they did that they noticed that there was an odd oily sheen all over her body. So after the blood had been drawn by the first nurse, Susan Kane, and she kept working on Ramirez and then suddenly fainted. The second nurse who took the syringe and saw the crystals within the blood also started feeling lightheaded and she actually ended up leaving the room to go sit down at the nurse's station and whenever she did, a couple of nurses were trying to talk to her. She was having trouble breathing. She was suffering from apnea, which is when you are breathing and then you stop for a few seconds and then you start again. It's a very unnatural breathing pattern. And then before she could answer any of their questions, she ended up passing out. The respiratory therapist who was in the room at the time, I think I said three nurses earlier, but they did all have different positions, but I labeled them as that. I'm not sure if that's incorrect or not. But the third person in the room named Maureen Welch was a respiratory therapist. And she also started experiencing similar symptoms. She was the third to pass out. And whenever she woke up, she said that she felt numbness in her limbs and couldn't move them. And she also experienced some burning on her face. While this was happening, the hospital decided that everyone needed to evacuate because they had no clue what was going on with this woman. And everyone, including patients and medical staff, except for a skeleton crew, exited the hospital into the parking lot. And that crew stayed to work on Ramirez to try to save her life. But within 30 to 45 minutes of working on her, she ended up dying and they ruled it kidney failure that was in relation to her cervical cancer. Whenever they were ordered to go out into the parking lot, the hospital staff that had been working with Ramirez and was in close con and were in close contact with her were ordered to take off their scrubs and put them in bags to hopefully control any sort of contamination that there might be. They also took some of the sheets and other medical supplies that had been used in Ramirez's room and they bagged it up, sealed it in a barrel, and sent it to a facility that handles hazardous materials. It turns out later that none of this was properly marked, so whenever an investigation had to happen, it was pretty much useless. You can see from the very beginning that a lot of stuff is starting to go wrong. And this hospital, the more I looked into it, really doesn't have a very good reputation. So you're gonna see all of these mistakes that add up to pretty much leave this mystery unsolved. So the county health department sent in two people to investigate what had happened with Gloria Ramirez. They interviewed 34 of the 37 staff from that night and and they came up that 23 out of those 37 had symptoms that they believed to be in relation to this case. They had a standard questionnaire and they got a list of symptoms from it that had occurred in these people who believed to be infected with whatever was happening. And the majority of these people said that they smelled fumes and that they smelled ammonia-like or like chemicals. Some of the symptoms that appeared were loss of consciousness, loss of breath, and muscle spasms. It was deemed that if people were within two feet of Ramirez, they were at higher risk to experience these symptoms, which is why the three hospital staff who were working closely with her all passed out. It was also concluded that more women than men experience these symptoms, which is gonna lead us into our first theory. And everyone had normal blood tests after the fact. Before we get into the first theory, I will say that medical resident Julie Gorchinski had been put into the ICU and spent two weeks there because she was suffering from issues that resulted from her contact with Gloria Ramirez. Her symptoms included breathing problems, hepatitis, pancreatitis, and a vascular necrosis, which is where the tissue in your knee starts dying because it doesn't have enough blood flow. That's really important. And apparently she also had bleeding in her brain, which is gonna make the first theory that I'm gonna say ridiculous that I even have to mention it. So after the investigation, because so many people suffered from symptoms after Gloria Ramirez was brought into the hospital, they decided to deem it mass hysteria. And also one 
apparently fact of mass hysteria is that women often suffer from it more than men which in the questionnaire that they did more women than men suffered from symptoms so they said yep these people just smelled something weird and they all went crazy <laughs> which is nuts okay crazy so that theory doesn't have a whole lot of information other than they did the questionnaire and they were like yep these people just went crazy because they thought of it in their brain but the lady who was in the ICU because she came in contact with her, even if you can convince yourself that like you're going to pass out or you feel nauseous because you're smelling something weird, which I think is very reasonable. You can't convince yourself to have bleeding in your brain in the tissue dye around your knees. You know what I mean? Like that just, that doesn't happen. So I don't know how those people got away with saying, oh yeah, these people just lost their minds for a little bit. And plus, if you think about it, Medical professionals are trained to deal with all sorts of situations and some lady whose heart isn't working very well, she can't breathe very well, she has cancer, I don't think is going to send these hospital staff members into some big frenzy and freaking out. Like she just had an oily sheen on her. I don't think it's that reasonable but this hospital isn't very reasonable. <laughs> So the hospital did do some blood and tissue tests, but a lot of information wasn't released from those. So they already started being kind of sketchy from the beginning. They also sent off some samples to the FDA to look for the types of drugs that would have been in Ramirez's symptoms, but nobody ever followed up with the FDA from the hospital. So they sent off this blood or whatever they sent off and it's for this lady that everyone's calling the toxic lady. She's a super mysterious case that the medical community can't fully explain and no one follows up. How does that happen? Like who lets that happen? Which is one of the reasons that this hospital, like I think this whole thing was a cover up. They were hiding something, something suspicious was going on. So the Livermore labs ran their tests on Ramirez's body and they concluded that she had been using dimethyl sulfoxide which used to be used sort of as like this gel stuff back in the day that athletes would rub on their sore muscles but they ended up finding out that the overuse of this product would cause eye damage and it was just really unhealthy so they took it off the market but it can be found in hardware stores as a degreaser now this product is helpful obviously for soothing pain and so they thought that Ramirez may have been using it to soothe pains that she was having due to her cancer, which would have explained the oily sheen on her chest. But it's also said to be able to absorb into the skin super quickly. So if she would have applied it on at home, it should have already been absorbed into her skin by the time they removed her shirt in the hospital. It's also said to have an oniony scent and a garlicky taste, which could have explained the reason for the garlic odor that was coming from her mouth. So the main theory with how this ended up killing her was that it built up in her system, which caused the kidney failure. Whenever she was administered oxygen, which when she first got into the hospital, I think I failed to mention this, um, they were giving her oxygen to help her breathe again. And that made the dimethyl sulfoxide turn into a new element called dimethyl sulfone. So very similar, just a slight molecule shift. <laughs> I'm not a scientist, I don't really know how all this works, which crystallizes at room temperature. So that could have explained why there were crystals that were seen by two medical staff in her blood. And then when she was administered the electric shocks when they were trying to fix her heart, that that could have turned it into dimethyl sulfate. So dimethyl sulfate is highly, highly toxic. When the blood was drawn, they think that the temperature change from it being inside her body to the temperature in the room could have caused a conversion that made the staff start to smell it and inhale it and cause their symptoms. I did see during my research that the staff symptoms were very similar to symptoms of people who inhale this compound but i did some research on my own and i found out that, that was not actually the case i'm not entirely sure what's true but my personal research found that it wasn't very similar so symptoms are apparently first supposed to appear four to six hours after inhaling this compound the staff smelled it almost immediately symptoms that i found were irritation of the respiratory tract ulcers on the throat hoarseness cough edema of the tongue lips 
and lung. However, ingestion symptoms instead of inhalation symptoms, which is what I just listed, did match up a little more with what they were experiencing, but no one ingested anything from her body. However, inhalation symptoms also include burning of the skin where blisters can appear. And as you remember, one of the medical staff did state that her skin felt like it was burning, but she never had any blisters. I also read this theory is highly scrutinized by the medical community and that has been disproven over and over. But I also read that it had appeared in some peer reviewed and highly accredited articles, but I did hear more that it was completely discredited. So what I first read about it being published could have been more outdated than the new information saying that most medical community members say, mm -mm, it's not real. The second theory is that Ramirez was somehow radioactive. There is not a lot of evidence on this one, which is why I wanted to mention it early on, but it's definitely interesting to think about. I don't know a lot about radioactivity and no one knew enough about Ramirez's home life to be able to conclude that she had been somehow involved with radioactive material, but it seemed like she probably wouldn't have been. So the third theory starts by us looking back on some previous events that had occurred within the hospital. So the year that Ramirez went into Riverside General Hospital was 1994. In 1991, there had been a poisonous gas leak from a sterilizer that radiated through the hospital. And then again in 1993, there had been sewer gas within the hospital. And at one point, a cancer patient and his wife had ran from their room saying they smelled gas and were pretty much fearing for their lives. And so the hospital was very well known for having issues with poisonous gas running through the hallway. So whenever this incident occurred with Gloria Ramirez, a team was sent in by the county to investigate the hospital and they checked the vents and there were no signs of any sort of gas that could have leaked through the vents, which is what caused all of the staff members to experience these symptoms. The third, and I think the best theory, my favorite theory, the one that's probably true, which is a little out there, which is why it's my favorite. I usually go for the more absurd theories just because I think they're a little more fun. But the third theory is that Okay, you're gonna laugh when I say this. Well, the third theory is that the hospital was smuggling meth ingredients. <laughs> I know it sounds crazy, but the more I tell you about the case, the more you're gonna understand why this is actually very probable. At this time, Riverside, California was known as one of the number one spots of meth distribution in the country. There is a theory that ingredients for meth had been smuggled through the hospital in IV bags and one of these IV bags that were contaminated with meth ingredients or a single meth ingredient was accidentally given to Ramirez and injected into her body and meth ingredients tend to smell like ammonia which is what was smelled in the hospital room at the time that the IV was being given to Ramirez. Whenever a forensic analysis was performed on Ramirez's body, it was found that there was an ammonia compound within her body, but they thought that it might've been a breakdown of one of the medications that she was taking for her cancer treatment. Also, the symptoms that the hospital staff members experienced are very similar to the symptoms that people can have whenever they are exposed to meth making materials and I learned that some people are more affected by these than others which could have explained why the three nurses passed out and the main doctor who had seen the crystals in her blood did not have any of these symptoms. So now that you know about all of these theories, I want to tell you a little bit about how the whole situation was handled by the hospital. After Ramirez's death and they were preparing for the autopsy, she had been sealed away in an isolation room so that her body wouldn't be exposed to anyone else and no one would experience any of these symptoms if that was even probable at the time but they actually constructed a special autopsy room that was sealed off so that the people performing the autopsy would be protected as well as everyone else within the hospital. They had no idea what they were dealing with, so they needed to take extra precaution. So CAV slash OSHA, which is a 
state worker protection agency was obviously involved and two men were assigned to the case and they were in charge of making sure that the autopsy was performed as safe as possible and they were actually the ones that were supposed to legally start the autopsy they were the ones who were supposed to say okay let's start now they weren't performing it but they were supposed to be there and they were supposed to monitor the whole thing right before the autopsy began scotty hill the head coroner actually asked two state workers to leave the premises and they obviously said no because they were legally supposed to be there but a police officer actually escorted them off of the premises which caused one of them to give a statement talking about the hostility that they experienced and said that he believed that something very serious had occurred within the hospital and that they were trying to cover it up and didn't want them to uncover it by viewing the actual autopsy. So the autopsy was performed. The people who were in the room performing the autopsy were in airtight suits with an oxygen supply and there were people outside of the room watching the autopsy be performed on a video monitor and they were also in suits. So these people took a lot of precautions because they were very scared of the body but then again something suspicious happened. So after the first autopsy uh, they concluded that it was kidney failure. So after the autopsy was done and they theorized the whole crystal, the dimethyl sulfate theory, the head of the lab in response to people questioning that theory said, we've never said this is what happened, just that people should look into it. So these people really had no idea what happened. <laughs> Also, Scotty Hill, the head coroner who kicked out the two men that were working for the state and supposed to be in charge of the autopsy, later said that the staff experienced these symptoms due to the smell of death, <laughs> which is so ridiculous. Um, and he later retracted that statement, obviously, because that's embarrassing. <laughs> but he said that and I think that's so ridiculous because obviously these medical professionals are probably exposed to death all the time. So many people have been exposed to dead bodies and how many times have people passed out, had to have been hospitalized with brain bleeding and the tissue in their body dying because they smelled a dead body. Like, come on, <laughs> come on buddy. That makes no sense. Also to add to this whole mess, <laughs> I said to the whole mess. <laughs> So to add to this whole mess, the top investigator who was assigned to the case actually ended up committing suicide one month into the investigation. She was said to have shot herself while on the phone with her estranged husband. So people said that she did this because she was under a lot of pressure and a lot of added pressure could have came from the fact that the hospital was trying to hide things and maybe she was a part of that, aka hide a meth ring. Later, when the syringe that had Ramirez's blood in it was trying to be uncovered, it was nowhere to be found and the hospital essentially said that they lost it. But the last nurse who dealt with it was actually asked by the fire department where she disposed of it and they had a long conversation trying to figure out where she had put it so that they could find it. And apparently she was under the impression that they were going to look for it, but no one could ever find it. So no test could be ran on that and that could have been a really crucial part of evidence, but somehow it was lost. After the first autopsy was completed, apparently, after several weeks, the family wanted to get the body themselves and have an independent autopsy be ran because they were very suspicious of the hospital. They didn't believe any of the causes of death they had established or any of the theories of what actually happened. So whenever they requested for the body to be moved and have a new autopsy be performed, the hospital actually sued the family to try to get them to have to follow the same protocol that they followed the first time, which kind of makes sense that they would want that same protocol to be followed. But in the trial for it, it came out that a second autopsy had secretly been performed. And during this autopsy, they were apparently saying that they were trying to finish what they did the first time. However, the first time they came up with a conclusion and anyone who knows how autopsies work, they're usually done in one part, not in two. The family finally received the body to have the third autopsy done, but when it was time to begin it, they realized that the heart was missing and most of the body had been contaminated with fecal matter and was just badly mutilated and 
had obviously not been taken care of, which if you think about it, first of all, they're taking all of these additional steps to protect their staff, to do all of this stuff. And you would think that this body would be very, very well taken care of. There's a freaking missing heart, there's fecal matter everywhere. And they just weren't trying to preserve, preserve the body. So I think someone intentionally sabotaged it so that the third autopsy couldn't uncover anything that would put the hospital under fire, which I think they were trying to cover up, which is that they accidentally injected this woman with an ingredient of meth. So 10 weeks after her death, she was released to be buried and finally have a proper funeral. And she was buried at a local cemetery in her hometown. So after all of this, two lawsuits actually emerged. One from Julie Gorchinsky, the resident who suffered for two weeks in the ICU. She filed a $6 million lawsuit and I could never find if she had won that or not. Um, but she sued the hospital for compensation for that. And the family, they filed a lawsuit for malpractice and wrongful death. They don't believe at all any of the theories that the hospital gave, any of the excuses. Her sister actually believes that she would have went to a different hospital. She would have probably lived after that visit. At the beginning, I mentioned that it was said that some of her, that some of Ramirez's blood was actually spilled in the ambulance. And if you think about it, nothing happened to the EMTs working in the ambulance. Nothing happened when she first entered the hospital. Everything weird started happening when she was given an IV, which I think helps confirm the theory that she was accidentally injected with something that makes meth. <laughs> and then if you look at how the coroner kicked out the state officials who were supposed to be there ensuring their safety, probably because he was more worried about them finding out what was going on within the walls of their hospital. And you might be thinking, okay, how is meth smuggling going to be happening within a hospital? But actually around the same time in Denver, a, at a medical facility, a meth lab was uncovered. It was being ran within a lab within that medical facility by a man who worked on night shift and he was operating the lab and his meth lab at the same time and it ended up being discovered by a supervisor. So it is something that actually happens. And if you look at the way the hospital handled, every, handled everything, how evidence was lost, how, you know, so many things that could have been done a different way didn't happen because it seemed like it was a messy situation. You know, they lost the bloody syringe. They didn't take care of the scrubs that the people were wearing. No one can explain why this one woman was in the ICU that still doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Just how the body seemed to be not taken care of and how the whole secret autopsy happened. There's no reason that any of this should have been happening if true theories were being delivered and honest work was being done. I can sit here and tell you what I believe all day, but officially this case is still unsolved. So I hope that you guys learned something from this. I hope you found it as interesting as I did. If you guys know anything else, feel free to leave a comment down below. Let me know what you think actually happened. If you have any new theories, I would love to hear them. But thank you guys so, so much for watching. Let me know also in the comments. We have a lot to talk about, but let me know in the comments what you thought of this future mysterious cases that you would like to hear about. I really want to make this a regular thing that I do on my channel. I really enjoyed the research and I really enjoyed talking about it. So let me know if you have any favorite cases you'd like for me to film for you. Don't forget to give this video a big thumbs up, hit that big red subscribe button and the notification bell that's right next to it so you never miss one of my videos. Other than that, thank you so, so much for being here and I'll see you next time. Bye!